and we should be good. All right, we are rolling once again on the Spaced Out Radio side. I apologize to everybody for the technical issues, and you know what? I'm just going to let my audience know, and we are back up and running. So, Bill, one of the things that uh, interests me about the whole healthcare thing, and I know you're going through a tough time with your wife right now, and, you know, have you ever just thought about leaving? Not because of the political side, but because, you know, a lot of people don't understand until it actually hits you how painful the whole health care system can be down there. Right. Uh, And yes, yeah, I I have considered leaving. Um, Wow, long, long ago, as as long as, actually, I thought about it after I had a long conversation with my mother who passed away in 1999, um, and then 9-11 9-11 hit, um, and I have, I have a lot of friends in New York City, and talking to them, and I've been to New York City many times, and I'm just thinking, like, you know what? <laughs> when, I, when I woke up, my, my wife at the time woke me up in the morning when that attack was going on, right? At, at probably around 9 a.m., and she said, she, just, she, was, she couldn't even talk. She was just weeping and sobbing, and she just pointed at the TV, and I'm like, you have got to be effing and kidding me. At first, I thought, like everyone else, oh, it's an accident, you know. And then, of course, they timed it so news cameras would be on the, on the World Trade Centers when the second plane hit, which, of course, it did. And right then, I knew. I'm like, oh, my God, this New World Order stuff, it's all real. And here it goes. And then the, the clincher was, oh, my God, one hit the Pentagon. I'm like, oh, no, this is it. We're, we're finished. And at that time, we still owned guns, right? So let's just say things got a little snappy. Um, and then uh, I was living in Southwest Pen- Pennsylvania at the time, and the plane that crashed, Flight 93, crashed about 30 miles from where we lived. So we're just completely freaking out. And um, you know, af- after that, after 9/11, I just thought, you know what, this might be a good time to consider, uh, you know, pulling up stakes and going elsewhere. And believe me, Canada was in the conversation. Um, I- I've traveled a lot in Europe, but I don't know. <sighs> At heart, I guess I'm sort of a stubborn American type, not necessarily in the usually accepted sense. I, I, I'm more like the person outside looking out, the, the person who likes to be left alone. and a Rugged individual, right? Let's, let's just say individual. And I, don't th- I don't think I could, I could maintain that lifestyle in, in Europe. However, Canada is different. And, uh, yeah, to, to cap your question, have definitely thought about it. And I, I know how others view Americans, because I speak to them all the time, meaning people living in Europe and Canada. I, I have a few friends uh, in Asia that I've done some writing jobs with, one of whom was a, a film director, uh, Jason Rosette, who, who did a documentary in New York City called Book Wars about, about these guys who sell books on the street. Um, so yeah, they view us with curiosity. You know, well, wh- why are you there if, if you have some in a horrible tragedy in your life, if you lose a leg or your wife gets cancer, I mean, you're looking at like a million dollars of, of bills. Why would you put up with that? And then, you know, as you just heard, the answer is complicated. I don't want to put up with it, but for the time being, that's how it has to be. No, I hear you. And this is where I think I'm very, very fortunate because it's one of those things where if anything happens on this side, my friend, I just go to the hospital. Yeah, you know it's there for you. You don't have to think like, wow, let's see, should I even go to the hospital for my possibly broken ankle, you know? Oh, I hear you. I hear you. Anyways, we could debate the whole healthcare system all night. Let's get to some aliens and and UFOs, my friend. That's why we brought you on. That's why we brought you on. Exactly. You know, why talk about the real stuff when we can get to the really real? Exactly. I'm, I'm ODing on reality. Hey, I want to go back to last week with the election for a second, okay? And I I don't really care with Trump or Hillary, whatever side anybody is on. This is not to be a political debate whatsoever. But as somebody who studies the field of ufology, how disappointing was it for you that Hillary didn't get in just to see what John Podesta would have tried to push on the UFO front? Well, um, I'll, I'll say somewhat disappointing because I do pay attention to what's going on like you know whenever of course these days uh the benefit of the internet
internet is that you hear everything, whether you like it or not. So I'm I'm almost certainly going to see you know uh, like e- even from uh, Podesta's earliest, I, I, it was a while ago when he first started mentioning UFOs, right? And I'm thinking, okay, there's even a, the slightest chance of, of some politician, a major one, you know, well known with experience, saying, okay, this is this is enough. We're gonna uh, we're gonna figure out a way to to lift the veil and and see what, if anything, is, has really happened. And you know, I, the first thing I think of is, okay, number one, if you're under if, uh, secrecy agreement, you know, non-disclosure, you can't say anything. If you do, there are repercussions. So that's why when people do speak out who claim to be ex-military and stuff like that, right away uh, they're full of crap because they can't violate that agreement. So you know, like when when some UFO writer says, oh, I interviewed uh, a former general so-and-so, and and here's what he said. I'm like, well, he said that for a reason and had nothing to do with, with the truth because they cannot violate that vow. That's lifetime. That goes, that follows you into retirement. So with Podesta, I'm thinking, well, let's see what happens here. And then um, others on the on the internet and on, you know, in the actual newspapers and um, I and for what it's worth, I get my news from National Public Radio and um, believe it or not, uh, BBC News because they are a lot more objective than American media. And with the Podesta thing, I think that Hillary Clinton may have have just used uh, him and his you know, belief system or lack thereof to get scrunch up some more votes from people who read the literature like us. Uh, and it, it may, it may have worked and it didn't succeed completely for her, obviously. I think there may have, that may have been at least part of the reason. And I also think that I, I know her husband, Bill Clinton, he's definitely interested in, in UFOs and stuff of that nature. And she, she probably is too. She's intelligent. She wants to know what's going on in the world. Um, so I think it was a little of both, like a genuine, you know, let's, let's try and get to the bottom of this and look how good I'll look if I'm the one who helps with that. And also, uh, a way to get votes. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much how I feel about that. I, I'm, it's too bad we can't at least get a, you know, how hard would it be for someone in a position to know these things? To say, okay, here is what the U.S. government really knows about the chances of extraterrestrial life, and this would be, if they know, it would be a yes or no answer, right? Yeah, they're out. They could, they could say they're out there, but they haven't been here, or no, we don't think they're out there. But as in, in recent news, uh, there may have been some some signals picked up from, I think it was, um, the Tau Ceti. It's a it's a star near Alpha Centauri, very close to us, like, well, yes. relatively close. Uh, I mean, there are almost certainly are other life forms out there. Whether they have been here, that's a different different question. But at least I, I think the general public could handle that knowledge. If, if any government knew for sure it was out there, I think we could handle that knowledge. Look at, the, look at all the trauma we've been going through. We could handle that knowledge. I think it would even make a lot of us pretty damn happy. You know what? I'll disagree with you on that one because the way I was I look at this is that we can barely handle what is going on here with the mess that we have made with our own planet. Now, if all of a sudden you throw in an extraterrestrial existence, whether they've been here or not, or whether we picked up a signal or not, I don't think the public is ready for that. The religious leaders will have absolutely no answer for that because they have indoctrinated most people that follow them, that there is only Earth and us and the planets around. There's no other intelligent life form out there. Everything else is demonic. I think we would be absolutely in for a living hell. I do not think as a society that we are mature enough for that answer. Okay, I I think my mistake was uh, my automatic assumption, and I'll, I'll admit it, okay, it's my my assumption is always that these are the intellectual knowledge seekers, open-minded people. However, um, there's a large number of people, as we now know, and I won't say why because it's obvious, um, who don't, who are not intellectual, and, and even some who are, as a matter of fact, who have, uh, you know, let's say fundamentalist beliefs, religion-wise, and yeah, they do see 
any possibility of, of outside uh, external life as being demonic or, you know, by nature it's got to be evil because it's not approved of. So, uh, okay, I've, I, I see your reasoning there, sir, about the, uh, when you bring in the religious angle, that's where we could get in trouble, especially in America, because now with, we're so divided here now, right, between, between the Trumpies and the non-Trumpies. So, uh, yeah, that could be a problem if, if there was disclosure right now. I, I've, I will change my opinion on that based on what you just said, that it might be a bad idea if, if that knowledge were to come out. Well, okay, it, it, should be, it, it should be covered up. But I don't. you're right, it probably would not be well received by a huge uh, amount of the population. I know you don't know John Podesta personally. I know you've dealt with people who know him. What do you think he is up to now that the election is over? He's ran two full terms with two presidents. He's lost this election. But here he is, in reality, the biggest name on the planet next to Paul Hellyer, who has come out and said UFOs, extraterrestrials are real. They're here. He's written four words on UFO books. Do you think he continues to serve this purpose for the field of ufology, or do you think he steps back into the business world and becomes anonymous? Mm, no, I, I think it's a, I, this is completely just, just my opinion, my take on it. I, I think it's a, genu, a genuine interest and a genuine hope, you know, like almost as if, well, this, this has to be, this has to be real. I think it goes back to uh, it's it's got to be a, a deeply driven a, a personal thing like like I, I know that there are people who cannot handle the thought that that there just may be life then you die and that is all and the only meaning to any of it is what we invest it with that there's no external meaning and that looking for it in religion and politics will basically drive you nuts unless you're well balanced and I, th- I think that Podesta has to he needs this belief. Some people don't need it. I don't need it. I'm just curious about it, and I, and I want to, to know what's going on, but I don't want to believe in it. Now, if it's proven to me undeniably, well, then I, I'll have no choice. But, but I think that in Podesta's case, he, he's genuinely, he, he is what he claims to be. Do you think he continues to trumpet the whole field of ufology, though? Um, well, I, I think at least the, you know, the extraterrestrial uh, end of it, people who, who believe in or want to believe in that, that we're being visited and that this is being concealed from us, um, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised that he hasn't been more, uh, I don't know how to put it, how, that he hasn't been more publicly uh, addressed by more, you know, more more political people with senators and stuff like that. I'm, I'm thinking they're just like, they're either thinking, A, you know what, I don't even want to touch this. To, the times right now are too volatile. Or B, they're thinking, um, they're just thinking personally, like, do I want to associate myself by going on the record, whether criticizing Podesta or agreeing with him? Because either way, you know, right now in America, you're going to, you're going to attract attention if you're a politician and you comment on UFOs, you know, positive or negative. I just find it very interesting indeed because, I mean, here we had, as ufologists, literally, we were steps away from seeing what would happen over the next couple of years if disclosure would happen or if Hillary would break her contract with Podesta because she even admitted that that was part of the deal in getting John to sign on with her to run her campaign. And now, no, it didn't help at all, you know, but on the flip side, Now we have almost this, in my opinion, and I'm curious to see yours, this regression happening where the field of ufology now disappears into that lower level of the alternative media that, you know, you know, next to Uncle Jethro's old underwear. You know what I'm saying? Like it goes back into the box. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. So, yeah, there were, yeah, it seems like possibility that there has been some uh, God, is this the right term? Credibility uh, damage, if there was any credibility. Uh, it seemed to be improving, but, um, 
Yeah, because if you look at, at what's going on in, in ufology, um, there, just like in everything else, it's not just ufology, there's this, I'll just call it a nostalgia movement of going back to like the really early, early cases in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, people are digging back into those again and bringing up the same arguments, the same ludicrous explanations. And I think it's, at least I'm, I can only speak for America, the Europeans, well, they've got their own deal going on there with, with Brexit, you know, but they're not digging in, they're not uh, taking comfort, shall I say, in nostalgia like we are in America. Like whatever was going on with with ufological investigations and things of that nature before the recent political things, it, it just seems to have been totally pushed away now. No one wants to deal with anything, and they're afraid, or they're angry, or both, and as far as that, the effect on ufology, just drifting back into, oh, let's go back to the to the fifties and read about George Adamski and the and the contactees. And uh, I can't say I'm not guilty of that myself because I am. But there, it, it seems to be, <clears throat> excuse me, it seems to be a little bit of a regression going on in the in the research and in the, the reading of it. Gail has a very interesting question in the SOR Space Travelers Club. She is asking, Bill, why don't you think John Podesta just steps out on his own and declares it publicly himself? Why do you feel he needs to stand behind someone else to stay to say it? Um, well, I didn't say that I feel he has the need to stand behind No, I, I, I worded that wrong. I apologize. Oh, no, that's, that's okay. I, I get it. Um, well, no, he doesn't need that at all. In fact, if, if he does know something and he can prove it, two completely different things, I'm all for it. He should take a personal stance. But if he does that, as, as I mentioned before, if he's under any kind of non-disclosure agreement, uh, he's, he's looking at jail time. So that could be holding him back. But I, I don't know what his, you know, what his level of classification is, what it would be, because they change all the time for politicians and military people when you when you, you know, move through your career, or in some cases when you regress back to a certain state. So with Podesta, I, man, I don't know what level he's at. I should know that, and I'm, I'm a little embarrassed that I don't. But I, he seems the type that if he, if he really knew something, he would, I think he would find a way to, I don't know, to leak it maybe, but it's, it's real shaky ground there with, with the legalities of it. If, if he has genuine knowledge, you know, and, and links to, to documentation, then you're getting into a whole nother, I don't even want to talk about emails and, you know, <laughs> classified documents or, or lack thereof. I hope that answered your question. For sure. And here's the thing, though. He obviously, with his security, ended up having some sort of security clearance on this topic. Are you surprised, though, that throughout the campaign when he was popping off for the better part of a year about UFOs, ask Hillary about UFOs, ask her about disclosure, that nobody really tapped him on the shoulder to say, hey, John, you might want to shut up about this? Um, yeah, that's a little unusual. It, it's kind of like, um, this, is, this is my example only, right? Obviously, because it's me talking. It's kind of like you're in a bar with your pal or somebody you're, you're at least associates with, and they're really smashed, and they're mouthing off, making a fool of himself, and you want them to shut up, Well, and you're not doing anything. Why would you, why would you let that happen? Well, you either want, you want that person to make themselves look like a fool, so no one will, uh, you know, it's, it's like the old uh, explanation, or at least one of them, for the men in black, where, well, what, why, why are they acting so ridiculous? Well, if they exist... They're acting this way because the people who report them instantly lose their credibility. So possibly that's one of the reasons why Podesta has not been, uh, let's say, slapped down by, by people who have the power to do that. Well, it's interesting indeed. Very interesting indeed. And, you know, we'll move on from the John Podesta thing because he's going to now wiggle off into the sunset with his pension and probably take over his company again as CEO. He'll be all right. You know, he'll, he'll just do just fine. I don't think the kids are hurting for college tuition or anything along those lines with him. A lot of people who I have talked to recently, Bill, in the field of ufology say that there has been a real 
downturn with the amount of sightings lately, especially quality sightings. Have you noticed this as well? Yeah, um, but I, I think, again, a lot, a lot of distractions going on in the world, not, you know, not just America. They had this, uh, it was just this earthquake, what was that, yesterday, a day before in New Zealand? Um, a seven point, it was a seven point something, like a seven point five or a seven point nine. That was that was a that was a big deal. And then um, there is there, there's political unrest, well, like there there ever isn't in in South Africa and Ethiopia. Um, I, I have a friend there who who has a kind of a special job in Ethiopia, and she is wor- actually worried about any more communication. So that's kind of phased out. Um, and plus, you know, to tap back into it again, there are, there are so many distractions going on these days. And, you know, Brexit is a huge one because that affects the world economy. Um, and then with, uh, uh, with within minutes of when it was announced during the election before Trump won that I, when it was first announced, it looked like he probably would. The, the, the stock market went haywire. Um, I, I mean, uh, finances globally went, went haywire. People in control of those stocks and bonds, traders, those went haywire. So it's kind of like uh, there's been so much distraction. I, I think that you, that alone uh, could account for the lack of sighting reports. Um, a, a few have popped up lately, at least around my neck of the woods. I'm, I'm in uh, northern West Virginia, almost in Pennsylvania. Um but those have turned out, I'm, I'm just thinking, probably between the Orionid meteor shower and the Leonid meteor shower, a lot of fireballs and bolides have been sighted. And believe me, if you've ever seen one, you probably have. Um, they're, they can scare the crap out of you if you don't know what they are. I hear you. I got a question from Mario in the SOR Space Out Radio chat room. He is asking, Bill, in the military, a non-disclosure is set for a certain amount of years or indefinitely. Do you know about this contract that is signed and for how many years it is? Um, I don't know specifics, but I think that... um, I'm I'm trying to come up with an example really quick here. Okay, let's say I get hired by... I get hired as an intelligence analyst by one of the ABC uh, communities, okay? So right away, I have to, I, I'm going to be signing some kind, of a, some kind of a non-disclosure agreement to have access to whatever I have to do for my job. Depending on, on, on the level of that, it's just going to be in, in motion. The agreement is just going to be legal and for a limited amount of time, but based on my employment, right? If I get if I get fired from my intelligence analyst job, then I, for the duration of my life, I cannot mention what I did, and in some cases where I did it. But most specifically, I, I wouldn't be allowed to talk about what I did, like if, if I was spying on certain countries or looking at looking at numerical values for finances in some other country or even our own country i could not ever say what that what work i did that would be for life and if i did i would be prosecuted and probably jailed subject to a huge fine so higher level people they they're they're bound to the same thing in terms of non the non-disclosure itself is what i'm saying you cannot disclose what what your work was if it involved classified material or even secret material do you think WikiLeaks plays a role in this? Uh, pardon me, repeat that. Do you think WikiLeaks plays a role in this? Um, well, man, they're certainly they're certainly tweaking a lot of nerves. Uh, I, I was surprised by that. I thought, uh, well, now when they first emerged, right, I'm thinking, well, this is pretty interesting. But I didn't take it seriously. I thought I was just, oh, these are some some pretty damn sharp, intelligent, you know, cyber type people, some hackers. But that but that's all. They're not going to have any effect. And and then, you know, things kind of escalated in that area. I'm like, wow, look at this. And then during this election and, and before, I'm like, you know what? This, this, is having, this is probably having some influence. And that probably isn't right. But I, then the, the, the liberal part of me is thinking, well, if there's some stuff that's really 
negative, I mean dangerous negative, about a politician, people need to know that stuff. So on one hand, I'm kind of, you know, WikiLeaks is all right. But when it, when it comes out to, like, now if they're, if they're, you know, putting nefarious information into the world, or let's just call it data, not even information, that isn't real, that can, you know, because people will, are not very big on critical thinking these days. Um, anything that could sway an election that isn't based in reality, that's really scary. So I'll, what I'll just say about WikiLeaks is that, yeah, they they have an effect, and then they're able to, well, mostly evade, you know, be being slapped for it. You've been studying ufology, and that's the re- big reason why we wanted to have you on tonight. What changes do you see coming in in the future when it comes to the way we are studying this? And the reason why I ask that is, as I said in my intro, we have groups like NASA who've been caught cutting feeds from the International Space Station, amongst other things, when strange objects seem to fly by. We have the SETI research that says they've never really found a signal after 30 plus years of searching the skies. We have MUFON, who says, well, maybe people are having experiences, but they seem to be more into the debunking game right now. When you look at the echelon of researchers out there, Bill, tell me your opinion of them. Is it good for the field? Is it just mediocre? Or are we just not doing the damn job properly? Um, well, looking at the groups, well, well, let's just start with NASA, okay? Um, I was paying a, you know, very close attention to, to these feeds, one of which was from the, uh, well, still is, from the International Space Station, right? And the reason I was, it started out with, um, I was hired by a digital learning company, not the one I'm, I'm doing some work for now. This one was in Seattle, and I was, I was hired to write basically uh, the Cliff's Notes to a science fiction novel by Neil Stevenson called um, Seven Eves. It's all one word, like Adam and Eve, Seven Eves. And it was set in the International Space Station right before um, a, um, an asteroid impacts with Earth. So I wanted to know everything I could about the International Space Station, which led me to watching these live feeds. And then I'm seeing reports on various Internet sites, <clears throat> excuse me, about the feed being interrupted. And then I'm thinking, well, there are a lot of reasons for that feed to be interrupted. And most of them should not be technical reasons, meaning, you know, their gear, this is NASA we're talking about, right, for crap's sake. So then when I see reports of objects, and then this coincidental, you know, coincidental um, stoppage in the feed. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Why are they blacking out? Then they're coming back on. And then I saw, in one instance, there was there was the i the the ISS feed, and then it was cut out. But there was another feed, and I don't know if it was from another satellite or from another part of the station. And you see this object, and the angle they were showing on the sensationalistic websites it looked it looked like a one of the classic triangular black ufos but in reality it was it was like some kind of a shield or a, a shielding blanket that was just had gotten away from from some uh, extra vehicular activity and was floating in space and it looked mighty strange so something like that they're covering up for embarrassment but then there were other objects that i saw at like extreme magnification where we're like, well, this is not re-entering space junk. This is not a communication satellite. They they were weird, almost abstract shapes, but you could tell it was a you know a hard physical object. So I I wonder about that. Are they covering up uh, experimental prototypes that got caught in the in the feed, or is there something else going on up there and that and that's being cut off? I I don't know. It is curious though. It's and even a little suspicious. I find that these groups, to me, seem infiltrated. And I realize that's an easy comment to make, Bill. You mean like MUFON? Yes, like MUFON, even NASA, 
probably the SETI research because what I don't understand is, and I realize there are people who are going to inflate their stories or their experiences. You know, if they see something that's moving across the sky, it's a satellite, all of a sudden it's a black triangle and it's hovering over their house at 200 feet. I get that that happens. I do. But when hundreds of thousands of people literally on a daily basis around this planet are seeing strange anomalies in the sky, not all of that can be human. Not all of that can be explained. And yet what I feel MUFON has done, the SETI research has done, NASA has done, is they've taken that personal experience that people have. Even researchers that are what we would consider the A-listers in this field are doing it as well. They've taken the experiencer and they've said, you know what, what you've seen or what you have videotaped no longer matters. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I would, I would agree that that is happening because I, I've seen it myself where, uh, although I'm I've, I've in agreement with the video stuff because that can be so easily faked. There are apps for your phone that are for that specific purpose. And uh, I've watched, I've probably watched thousands of them by now. And some of them are very, very well done where you're like, you know what, I'm looking at an incredibly eerie image. And then I have to admit, um, for as much as I, I chime on about, about extraterrestrials, you know, there are no, none of them have ever been here, I'm disappointed when I see a really good video and I find out how it was made. I'm like, oh, man, come on. Is it, those people really, really hurt uh, the field of genuine investigation by, you know, hoaxing. It, it always has hurt it. But these days it hurts it more because everyone but everyone is, is on the Internet and they're seeing the stuff and they're not going to be thinking, hmm, how is this made? Uh, you know, some people are. But, like, your general viewer just looking, they're going to go, wow, that is weird. Did you see this? And then immediately they're on Facebook. Look at this, look at this. And that generates the belief system um, and it generates uncritical thinking. But as far as, like, yeah, there are some knee-jerk reactions out there from researchers saying, okay, immediately we get, we got to flush this down the can. And I think I just said that about myself um, because it's usually true. But, yeah, unfortunately, if there are any anomalous images, they're being lost in the, just in the great sea of, of junk out there. Do you believe, then, that a lot of this information that is out there that is being, quote, end quote, debunked, or the videos that are being faked, do you think there is maybe this giant conglomerate of government disinformationalists that are out there putting this information out there to keep the public under the guise of what they believe the government is keeping from them or not keeping from them? Well, <clears throat> well you're talking about one of the things that got me interested from the start, aside from, from some personal very strange experiences, was when I first read about the possibilities of... Um, psychological manipulation psyops and this was this i found out about this it had nothing to do with ufos i read a book called operation mind control by walter bowert this came out in 1978 and it was where i first read about mk ultra the cia's mind control program you know this really existed unfortunately most of the documents were were destroyed in the 70s but there's still a lot of them out there you just go on your computer and type in and the K Ultra, and you will get enough reading material probably for the rest of your life. But that got me interested in, okay, what, what, what's this mean? And then I'm reading about, uh, in World War II, psychological operations. Uh, this was a RAND Corporation document, by the way, where um, one of their specialists was saying that the psychological operations in World War II had put together this, it must have looked ridiculous then, uh, a 12 foot tall device that could walk on its own and made banging noises, flashing lights, and they they ran it through a, a village in northern Italy, where where they were they were battling fascism, right? And they were able to spook an entire village, and to actually terrify these people, which would have worked then. I, it may work now, but it wouldn't work for long because somebody would blast it with a shotgun. But that's where I first discovered or, or learned that it existed, even, uh, psychological manipulation. 
I think that has been used and is still being used by, I, I don't know who, but it would almost certainly, it would have to be somebody with that level of control, which would be government control. And, the, and now I think there's even, um, a lot of it's being farmed out to, uh, to corporations because they are, they are not under the government umbrella, right? Um, so as, as you mentioned, I think there, there's a strong possibility that some of these videos are being put together by, let's just say, uh, you know, official hands, and they're promoting a, a belief in UFOs. It, it's, it's almost documentable. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to come up with names here. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the writer uh, Jacques Vallée first wrote about this in the early 90s in um, uh, his, his trilogy. It was uh, Dimensions, Revelations, and I can't think of the name of the other book, but he, he was bringing up, because he was talking to William Cooper, who was unfortunately shot to death by government agents, but in his case it was because he was a little wacko about guns and tax evasion, and he fired on federal agents and they killed him. But anyway, he was interviewed by Jacques Vallée, and that, this idea came up about Area 51 and manipulation of belief systems, and... Uh, to, to cut down this overly long response, I think there is a definite possibility of, of disinformation, not misinformation, disinformation, stuff that's put out there basically to mislead people. And on another level, you know, the Romans started it. Uh, give, them, give them circuses to uh, take their mind off the real business of what's going on. And then uh, some other some other arms of this manipulation, they're, they're in place to hide, as they always have, since the, the 50s at least. Uh, they want people to confuse UFOs with prototypes and uh, experimental aircraft, black operations. Well, what better way? People have actually called the Air Force and said, I just cited this and this and this, and this was in a time in the Southwest where you, cannot, you still can't hide overflights of test vehicles. That's why they test them at 3 o'clock in the morning. People are going to see these things once in a while and report them, and, and the Air Force will say, well, what do you want us to do? We don't know what it is. And nine times out of ten, they don't know what it is because they're not going to be contacted by the control tower or, you know, yeah, hey, we're doing a black flight at 3 a.m. Just wanted you guys to know. <laughs> We got about three minutes here before we're going to go to break here. I got to get a quick question in from Everett, and this lead led to my next question, anyways. What's your opinion of MUFON? Well, like, like I don't want to say all these organizations. Let's just name the the biggies. Um, well, I'll just MUFON in particular. I, I think the there's a good chance all of them are. Uh, is infiltration the right word? It, yeah, I guess it is. Um, but one of them was even uh, was it NICAP, not NICAP. Uh, one of the one of the earlier ones f that was formed in the fifties was actually formed by an ex CIA man. Um, is that uh, Donald Ke Kehoe? Uh, oh man, I think it was NICAP. But yeah, that's a definite possibility, and here's why. I think that the the formal organized UFO groups, right? I, they almost certainly are at least watched monitored, surveilled, whatever you want to call it, because a lot of these people go to places like the aforementioned Area 51 and near to where I live, uh, right, Patterson Air Force Base. They go there and they, and they look for things, whether those things exist or not. And a lot of these people are a little crazy, and they get, they get in trouble by trespassing. And for one thing, if you go to Wright Patterson, uh, I can tell you right now, there are signs on, on certain areas that say, you you know, use of deadly force is authorized. They will shoot you. And that is why I think some of these groups are infiltrated and watched, because if they discover something or get some information, or even, let's say, happen to get a photograph of a classified aircraft or some other classified operation, and they put that information on the Internet, you know, well, who looks at the Internet? The entire world. So, uh, and, and this excuse was used back in the uh, late, in, during the Cold War, why a study was done. Why, you know, why are people even paying attention to, to ufologists? Or why, is, why do people think they're being spied on? Well, because they were. 
because we were worried about foreign agents seeing this information gathered by ufologists if it, if they had somehow accidentally gotten some classified business into some classified business and that's why I think it still goes on because somebody has to watch it to make sure that that information is not getting out that shouldn't be out because it could be a threat to national security or it could and, be nothing at all and on that note we're going to hop out for our first break on spaced out radio Bill Grabowski is our guest. You can find any of his books on Amazon. We'll be right back after this. Looking for news beyond the mainstream news? Head to spacedoutradio.com and check out the SOR Spacewire. This is Spaced Out Radio's Eric Markham, news director for the SOR Spacewire. Daily, I will bring you intriguing stories and outlandish reports from what's going on around the world. UFO sightings, paranormal activity, conspiracies, alternative health, and so much more. And if you have news, email me at news at spaceoutradio.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with U4COP. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com. Have you had an experience you can't explain? Had a run-in with ghosts, maybe Bigfoot, or seen lights in the sky? Hi, I'm Mike Schmidt from the SOR Sight Lines. I'm here to investigate your sighting. Head to spacedoutradio.com and fill out a report on the sight lines. All your information is 100% confidential, and I will help you figure out what you've been seeing. File your report, and let's find out the answers together. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you'd join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com where I... Vincent Zunza and my super sleuth partner Alexandra Sullivan track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest, from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock loud and proud. In high definition, Radio 702 Rocks, Las Vegas. Have you ever had an extraterrestrial experience? One you just couldn't explain? Well, maybe I can help. Hello, I am Samantha Mullet. On the second Tuesday of each month, I will join Dave Scott on Space Out Radio to bring a human aspect to ET contact. It's something I've lived with my entire life, and I'd love to help you understand. Let's share our experiences. The ET Experience, the second Tuesday of each month, only on Space Out Radio. 
Hi there, this is Jolene with Revila Reiki and Readings, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. SpacedOutRadio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Hi there, this is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Spaced Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. Do you have a topic or a guest that you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Let us know at spacedoutradio.com where you can sign up to become a Space Traveler member today. Or you can find us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to the second hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you along for the ride. We want to thank everyone listening in at the United Public Radio Network live on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and 160 countries around the world. Thank you for allowing us to be in your home on a nightly basis. Hey, if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Do us a favor, take the time to visit freedomslips.com and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight for if you're an SOR space traveler. Obfuscatory is your password. Obfuscatory. He actually gave me one I can pronounce. I'm pretty happy about that tonight. Bill Cardwell sets the password each and every night. If you're an SOR space traveler, you know what to do with it. If you want to follow us on social media, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio on Twitter. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott SOR. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download this show and others on iTunes. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. While there, you can join the SOR Space Travelers Club. Equates to about five bucks a month. You get some pretty nifty features on there. You can also read up on the SOR Spacewire. Check out my latest blog. Listen to some Bumblefoot and so much more. We try and make it a little bit for everybody on there. Tonight we are talking the study of UFOs. Author William Grabowski is with us. You can find all his books on Amazon and in any major bookstore. Bill, welcome back. Thank you for welcoming me back. And um, I like the use of um, obfuscation there. There's a, there was an old bumper sticker that used to go around um, and that bumper sticker stated, it's true obfuscation. Oh, well, you know... <laughs> well, that, well, well, Bill Cardwell comes up with some pretty eccentric passwords for our space travelers. One. Yes. That's a good one. Yes, yeah. he is quite creative when he comes up with it. You know, so w- that's why we just let him loose on it. We just let him loose. <laughs> right before the break, my friend, we were talking about MUFON. And if yeah. they're infiltrated, if they're not. What do you think Robert Bigelow's connection is to the group still today? Oh, brother. Um, or, oh, big brother. Just kidding. Um, I, I don't know. The last I read about, about Robert Bigelow was um, that, he, that he was out of that, that specific focus. But, I, you know, I could be wrong on that because news changes all the time. I, um, I read the book that, that uh, written by George Knapp and a, and a scientist 
um, the book about the uh, the Skinwalker Ranch, which of course that's still up in the air, and that was funded by Bigelow, and he of course has associations with Jacques Vallée, um, who is who has been getting crapped on lately on the internet. Um, so uh, yeah, obviously big big money, and I think he's another guy that has a genuine interest in in ufology and and in anomalies in general you know going to the to the effort uh probably not a big financial effort for for a guy of his wealth but to purchase all his equipment and to make sure that he hired you know actual accredited scientists to study what might be paranormal phenomena that's that's pretty cool in my book um uh black light and my life but i mean bigelow um has he been associated with mufon did I miss that somehow? Absolutely. He bought into it. Oh, okay. After he bought the Skinwalker Ranch. Okay. I don't got it. I don't know how I missed that. Um, but it is possible one of the one of the old memory banks there blew out. But so are you saying that he's he's still active now or are you do, are well, you asking? Well, apparently he got out of the whole MUFON gig. Now he may be getting back in, much the same with the Skinwalker Ranch. But yet he is like an international man of mystery, and I'm not talking the Austin Powers way. Right, right. Yeah, he is. A lot, a lot of, uh, you know, allegations in that area of of government collaboration. Um, you know, I've now if anybody would be involved in that area, a guy with that sort of wealth who who has connections with... You know, universities and researchers. Uh, yeah, there could that could be a possibility. I'm not accusing. I'm just saying I can understand why that sort of talk is going around because uh, he he is, you know, pro- and probably part of that is a personal decision. Well, if I make myself look more mysterious, I will attract more attention. Um, possibly of, you know, possibly good attention, but I he could be a bit more. Um, I don't know a bit more revelatory about what he's into, but he he's pretty much always been, you know he will you know he will say yes I'm on this board of directors I have contributed this and that but that's pretty much been it he hasn't you know made a lot of statements publicly anyway. I want to get to a few questions from our audience if you don't mind. Sure. Trip is asking if we look back at the battle over L.A., the UFO incident there during mm-hmm. World War II. In your estimation, was it a UFO, a Chinese bomb balloon, or a weather balloon? Wow. Um, that is an interesting thing. There was um, there, there is a website, and this is not a plug. I'm just going to have to mention them because I found them hugely useful. They have these archives going back to the, the earliest UFO publications, right? Um, it's called Saturday Night Euphoria, UFO-oria. And I was looking at um, actual newspaper newspaper archives. I think it was like the L.A. Times, um, if that existed then. Whatever the yeah yeah of course it did. The Los Angeles papers were discussing that the morning after it happened. And you know that I think that was the the first and possibly the only incident where uh, people were actually killed because soldiers fired upon what they thought. Well, they didn't know what it was, but they fired on what could have been, in their minds, you know, invading aircraft. And there is there was a photograph reproduced, not you know, not too well. It's all it's very grainy because it's reproduced from from newsprint um, of you know whatever these objects were in the in the spotlight. You can't tell, but they don't seem to you know share the configuration of a of a common aircraft. But, you know, and then were they balloons? Well, if they were, it seems as though, cause they, I mean, they were heavily fired upon, that they would have been obliterated. And whatever was fired upon, apparently it didn't affect it. So I, I'm not even sure if I have a solid opinion on what those were. All, one thing I, I, I feel confident about, though, they weren't aircraft, as as in, you know, Japanese aircraft or some some other enemy spying on us. I don't think they were balloons either. I don't know what happened with that. That that could be, you know, a genuine anomaly because and it's tragic that people were killed because, you know, these huge shells were going off. Um, I, I don't know if that one will ever be solved. 
It's definitely a mystery. And you know what the funny part about it is, as much as we talk about Roswell, it's, and it seems like this whole situation with L.A. and I believe 1942 seems to be swept under the rug a little bit. It seems to be covered up that, yeah, we'll talk about it, but there isn't enough information out there, so we're just going to shut up about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, look at the the technology at the time. I mean, if anybody actually happened, uh, how that, you know, the picture was, it had to have been a military, well, maybe not. It could have been a civilian who took that picture. I don't know who took it, but that's all they had. They had crummy cameras, you know, so beyond anyone actually coming out officially and saying, okay, here's what really happened. You know, I, I think a lot of this, the silence or on that is based on there's no information and also uh, genuine regret and shame that people were, a couple people died from that. Let's move on here. Joe has a question for you. Bill, have you ever had an experience seeing a UFO or an experience with an extraterrestrial? Um, no on the second. Yes on the first. Um, t- two sightings, but, but the one I'll focus on or, ha- has a much better chance of being, um, I don't know what to call it, unexplained, uh, and I'll make it fairly quick. I, I was working at a test and instrumentation company in Cleveland, Ohio, actually in Solon, Ohio, which is my, my birthplace, which is up on uh, very close to Lake Erie, northeast Ohio, near Cleveland, and driving. I worked at night. I was the backup guy for the computer system, and I was driving back home, or actually back to the company after getting lunch, and I saw two very bright white lights separated by maybe a couple hundred feet. And, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to determine distance in the dark, but I also happen to be an amateur astronomer, so I know what's there and what it looks like, and I don't, I don't confuse things like aircraft and satellites. But it was raining, and I saw these lights, and when I got back to the parking lot of this company, I got out of my car and, and stood there and watched this thing. And it was, it was in the cloud layer, moving slowly, and given that I was within half an hour of Akron, Ohio, where the Goodyear blimp, at least it used to be headquartered, that's what I thought it was, because it made no sound, and it drifted slowly. And then later on, I found out that usually dirigibles, blimps, they're not... They're not known for being moved around at night unless they're hovering over a you know a sports stadium. Um, nor do they have com- the light configurations that this had. It, it had just two bright white lights, widely separated. I stood there and watched it, and it slowly turned into a vertical position and went straight up. And I have to say, at the time, this was this was 1992. That really got on my nerves. <laughs> so. And also, it was pre-internet, at least for me. I didn't have any kind of hookup. I know there was, like, primitive bulletin board systems in the early 90s, but I wasn't on them. And um, I, I, I just kind of put it away. And then years later, I scoured, uh, you know, we were just talking about MUFON and ICAP. And I scoured report UFO reports from Northeast Ohio looking for, looking for this, and I didn't find anything. So, so that's like that's a mystery to me. And, and then during that same period and before were the uh, Hudson Valley UFO sightings reported by uh, the now unfortunately discredited Philip Imbrogno, and uh, I think yeah Alan Hynek, and he wrote this book about the uh, the sightings of the, the big triangular aircraft. So my my final say on that is I think that I may have seen one of those. Those prototypes, a triangular aircraft, even though I couldn't see its its outer shape, it was it was big, it was slow, and it was low in the sky, and it was silent. Um, so that that's my guess on what that was. What the hell it was doing in Cleveland, I have no idea. Let's get to another question here. This one comes from JP. He is saying, Bill, what do you think are, are the source of Fortean events? Oh wow, that's how long how long do you have? Um, that's another a favorite area of study because I picked up a gigantic omnibus of uh, well everything Charles Fort wrote except for his novels, the, the Book of the Damned, which contains all three of his books. Um, fascinating stuff. I, I think the first book I ever read by him was was Wild Talents, and that was published in 1937. His last book, I got a, a hardcover of it. 
in like eighth or ninth grade. But anyhow, he's reporting, as you know, if you know Fort, he's reporting on weird weather events. Um, of course, weird. He was one of the first to actually write about uh, so-called UFOs without calling them that because the term didn't exist yet. Um, you know, anomalous falls, like, you know, fish falling from the sky, blood falling from the sky, or at least red-colored hail. Um, so what are the sources? A lot of them are obviously meteorological and misconstrued as something else. Others are just pure out bizarre, like the, uh, the fish falling from the sky in England, and, and this has happened in other places as well. And the usual explanation for that is, well, obviously they were, they were sucked up by a tornado or some other whirlpool. And that isn't right, because if you apply a little thinking to that, critical thinking, let's say a tornado sucked up a pond, uh, which they can do, you're gonna, you may get a fall of frogs, but you're also going to get a fall of fish and, you know, algae and rocks and, and crap that come out of a pond. But in these cases, they're just these, you know, there's a mile-long line of fish. So, yeah, a lot, a lot of explanations and, and mysteries in Fort, you know. I, and, and he got all his info out of science magazines, uh, newspaper reports, very little from the man in the street, so to speak, because Fort was, was reclusive. But um, that, that stuff is like, you know, it's, it's been the Bible for hundreds and hundreds of, of books and movies. But I, I think that, yeah, I, I thank God that Fort exists or existed and wrote all that stuff. But a lot, a lot of it can be linked to natural phenomena. And some, of, some of it, it it's, still, it's still up in the air. Like, what is it? No pun intended with the up in the air remark. Mario has an interesting question here. He's asking, Bill, do you believe we have a, split, a space fleet, and how far do they operate in? Our solar system, galaxy, further out? Oh, you mean like a, a covert space program? Uh, no, I don't. For one thing, you, you can't hide it. For another thing, um, the, the, the money, all the money is going, I always say follow the money, right? Well, let's say that for a reason. All the money is being spent on, if, if anything is discovered that can be very, very useful, like let's say a, a, a new drive system, like some kind of a plasma drive system that can help us get to the stars a lot faster than, than our current you know, some basically pretty slow space vehicles, it's going to be weaponized or otherwise militarized. Um, so, yeah, we have a space fleet, but it's the one we all see in the news. Um, and they've even they've retired the space shuttle, probably for good reasons. And now it's, it seems like space is being privatized, and that, that's not a bad thing. You know, if someone can afford that and they have the research and they can get people into space, I'm, I'm all for it. And, and this proposed Mars mission, but as far as like, you know, the, I think the only things that can you could really say are secret that are up there are spy satellites because they have the, the orbits can be controlled and they they know when other satellites can observe them. That's all taken care of. But the the secret space missions, I mean, I don't even know what the purpose of that would be. I think that is something that we're still trying to figure out, whether or not it's there or not. Now, you mentioned early on in the show, in our number one, that you believe that anybody who does come and speak out, a.k.a. a whistleblower, realistically, they're probably giving some sort of false information. Yet we do have a lot of people out there who believe and who have studied that the secret space program is real. We have bases on Mars. We have bases everywhere. Even if we didn't, how far advanced do you think we are in the black ops side comparatively to what we are showing the public today? Well, uh, from what I've been able to gather from um, the, like the official aviation magazines, which can only be so official if you understand what I mean, that and, and various other writers, um, or I, sh I should say more on the journalistic side, who actually go out there and follow these things and um, it, it seems to be about fit. There's a 15 year gap between a prototype and when we, and when the public sees it, my example would be the stealth fighter was well, being tested in the, or first being put together, researched, how could it be done in the, as early as the late sixties and into the seventies. And we first learned about it 
meaning the general public, by accident. Someone got a picture of it. Um, the F-117 stealth. Yeah, I think that was 1989, 1990. So that was in development for a long time. And hence, that's why I think these reports of, you know, and they're almost certainly true of these this very weird aerial activity over, you know, Area 51, the, the, the least secret secret base in the world. Some of the, the objects reported there and often even filmed, you see these and you're like, okay, well, if that's not fake, what the hell is it? Um, you know, obviously they're testing, they're testing drones. Um, I mean, I mean, advanced drones, not the ones that, that we hear about buzzing through the sky and, and bombing people. They're testing more advanced stuff that, that causes in, intense lighting and, uh, which I, I would guess they're, they're experimenting with gravitation drive systems and magneto systems that cause, that cause illumination. But, but when you think about that seriously, any object that's meant to be stealthy that makes that bright of a light is not very stealthy. So there, so there is a mix-up, but it, I think it, it's almost a general acceptance that what we see is 15 years behind of what's actually available. Trip wants to know what your thoughts are on the Black Knight satellite or slash UFO. Oh, okay. Getting back to uh, at least when my first reading about that was was through John Keel, um, who, I, who I've been accused of worshiping, by the way, and that could have been true for a while. But I, I do see that uh, there there are holes in Keel's writing, and he himself often, let's say tweaked the truth a few times but mostly he, he was he was more of a, a journalist type curious who just wanted to find things out and i first read, read about the uh the black knight in his work and it, it is curious because uh i'm pretty sure i'm correct when i say that it was pre-sputnik was it not um sputnik went went up uh, the first object we ever put in this not we the russians put into space and the, I think the Black Knight was reported. Uh, if I could pull the book down, down now and look at it, I would, but that would be too time-consuming. I think predates the the Black Knight predates Sputnik. So, and, and I've heard other explanations. Well, those were false radio returns or something. Well, a fa- even a false return has to bounce off something. And what would have been in low Earth orbit before Sputnik that came from mankind? Well, either something very secret which is really doubtful because the American government panicked when Sputnik went up. So my opinion on Black Knight, I, I don't know. Oh, it's one of those mysteries. I'm still not convinced that it's a satellite. I'm convinced that it's probably just a piece of space junk, maybe from a, an asteroid or from an asteroid belt that came and somehow got lodged in our atmosphere you know what I'm saying? I just, I'm yeah. not sure. I mean, the it, the conspiracy sounds beautiful. It really does. Oh, yeah, it does, because it's intensely mysterious and and somewhat frightening. And the thing is, it could very well be part of a, a launch vehicle, because those have been confused for UFOs before, because at the right angle, they reflect, and at night, you'll see, you'll see a piercing, a fierce bright point that looks like a moving star. And then also, there could easily have been launches, before Sputnik, by the Russians and even by us, and then you know, which cannot be disclosed. Well, they could be now, but at that time, and Black Knight could still be a piece of that junk because, as you probably know, there are literally thousands and thousands of of pieces of crap floating around in orbit, from you know, paint paint flecks to you know, larger objects left over from the the, the really dirty uh, Apollo and Gemini phases. Hmm. So when you look at anything like that, do you really think that if aliens can get their ships right into our atmosphere through radar without happening, that they really need a satellite? Uh, well, yeah, why would they need a satellite? You're right. Exactly. Also, uh, why I have absolutely no, no uh, I can't invest any validity into like alien abduction and all that stuff because of the stupidity of it. Why would they need to abduct millions of people to figure out what a, a medical student can learn in one hour? Makes no sense. 
Let's get to Claudia's question. Claudia is asking, Bill, what do you think of the mural inside Denver Airport and the plaque that says One World Order? And do you believe there is a base under the airport? Um, I'm not too up to speed on that. I, I know of it, but uh, whenever I hear the term, you know, like One World or New World Order, and of course it's always, there's even that song by Ministry where uh, the industrial band Ministry that starts out with Bush's voice saying, A New World Order. Um, you just have to be careful with the source of who's, who's using those words. Because on, on one hand, yeah, there's definitely a, you know, there are globalists, globalists who want a one world order, you know, and sometimes they just use that. It's like a buzz phrase. They don't mean anything by it. They just want to be, they want, you know, attention paid to them. But I have a problem with, with globalists and, and people who, who use words like Illuminati because, for one thing, our governments can't agree on one damn thing. They hate each other. They're suspicious. They're paranoid. The idea of them uniting, forget it. Never happen. Yeah, even if it's based on, well, it's all going to be based on at the finest level. The final level will be the emotional and the belief level. They will never, ever unite. Not possible. So anything, you know, a plaque stating this and that, um, it couldn't mean anything. It's it's up to you. It's your interpretation. As far as like a secret underground base or installation i mean that's possible anywhere there is uh, in fact in, in west virginia underneath the greenbrier hotel this gigantic sprawling hotel there is a military holdout which was secret for a long time until i it may have been just an employee who publicly said oh yeah there's this weird big door down there and there's a government base underneath it and there is <laughs> easily can be found out online underneath the Greenbrier Hotel. Not even a secret. But as, as, as far as the, the airport, I've been to that airport, actually. Um, I recall they wouldn't serve me beer because I couldn't find my ID. And at the time, I was like 30. But anyhow, uh, that, that's my take on New World Order and uh, my take on not knowing a whole lot about what's in that Colorado airport. Good Canadian kid Ron is asking, the Bermuda Triangle and the Great Lakes Triangle are reputed to have alien encounters. Do you believe that it's paranormal, alien, or just something natural? Uh, just something natural, especially with Lake Erie. Lake Erie is extremely shallow. Unlike the other Great Lakes, uh, which are, uh, in, in freshwater comparison, they're very deep. Um, like 900 feet plus. Lake Erie, I think the, the deepest part of Lake Erie is not even 100 feet. Um, and it's littered with shipwrecks because I, I grew up 15 miles from Lake Erie and we've made constant field trips during school. Um, and even, even, I'm actually glad you brought this up, even heard stories about um, anomalous whirlpools and which are true because in shallow water like that, some of the, some of those storms that come in over Lake Erie are really vicious they're, and they're real fast. And you'd be surprised how violent they can be. They will they will knock ships over. And depending on who you are and who you, who you hear that story from, you know. Well, I saw lights in the sky before this ship went down. And the Edmund Fitzgerald. There's a conspiracy theory about that. So when you're talking about Great Lakes, you're talking about very, very severe storms. Um, and there are a lot of UFO stories associated with the Great Lakes. I know there's the one about the, uh, the fighter jet that was supposedly tracking a UFO, and, and it was a radar sighting that came down in was it Lake Michigan. And that, that recently came up because someone claimed they found the wreckage, and he turned out to be a hoaxer. But uh, Bermuda Triangle, uh, that, that also seems very, very precarious about, you know, UFOs being involved with that. Let's fire off another question here because we only got you for 30 more minutes and I want to make sure the audience gets their questions in. Gail is okay. wondering if you have studied at all these weird trumpet noises that have been heard all around the world. And she's wondering if you think maybe it's UFOs announcing that they are here. Yeah, I have studied those. Um, every single one has been hoaxed, in my opinion. 
And the only, see, the only way I can study them, though, is by uh, the same way everyone else can. There, there's, you know, there are people outdoors, and this, uh, this sound comes over, and it's a horrible sound. I'll tell you that right now, okay? <laughs> when I first heard one, I thought, you know, what in the screaming hell is that? And I first thought, it sounds to me like um, the place I used to live was very close to a scrap metal place, and they had this huge compactor, and it made a horrible noise, sometimes at 4 o'clock in the morning, which sounded like like those trumpeting sounds, like this, this wretched, metallic, horrible, like almost like a Godzilla-type sound. And then when I heard, I heard the, uh, the first of those trumpet sounds, it was a couple of years ago when I heard one, and you see the people reacting to it on camera, and I'll tell you what, they're, they're good actors, or they, are re- they were reacting to a genuine sound from somewhere, I don't know. But here, here's what I find real strange about these sounds, is that you, why were there no reports ever until after the movie Spielberg's version of War of the Worlds came out, where, where those gigantic tripods, they made this really scary, horrible sound too. And then soon after, you start hearing these sounds. I, I think those are hoaxed. And uh, that's my final take on it, because if they're not, why haven't I heard one? Because they've been reported in West Virginia. They've been reported in Ohio. Never once heard it. So I don't know. You have to look at the source for that. And when you trace them back, you will almost always find, you know, some kids screwing around, or maybe not even kids. But when when they examine the uh, audio signatures of these, you're, you're seeing, like, it does. It doesn't pan out like a normal sound would. It has like a, a rise and then a decay and a fading out. They look like manufactured sounds. It's very interesting because I know north of me, there's been sounds of almost like something digging underneath, like the scraping of rocks on metal. And that happened about three hours north of me, and there is audio on YouTube in regards to that. And I know people have heard that scraping sound as well. Do you see that as different from the trumpets, or is it all in one? Well, that, you're talking subterranean, right? Yes. I mean, those, yeah. I mean those, are, those are documented. They have been for, God, over a century because there are earth movements, and, and in fact, there was even there was an earthquake here, last, not last year, in twenty, I think it was twenty fourteen. Um, I actually slept through it. I, I mean, I I would have rather not have slept through it because it, it was minor, okay. But people recorded sounds, and um, in fact, they had recorded sounds before the earthquake, and it could be part of what you're describing, like um, so. God, what's the word? Oh, tectonic. Activity, you know, shifting of gigantic plates and rocks, they will make a horrendous sound, and it could and it can be recorded. But I don't think it's connected to uh, these sounds that seem to come from the sky. Not for one, like I just said, I think those are all completely fake. And if they're not, well, prove it to me. Burden of proof is on the people, not me. But it still comes back to the fact that people aren't, for the most part, making this up. There are good people out there who are having extraordinary experiences. Oh, so I, I, I agree. So as a researcher, then, how do you feed through the BS comparatively to the stories that are real or the audio or the video that is real? Well, easily. What I, I do the one thing very few people who write about UFOs do. I actually talk to people. Or if I can, I go to the place where, you know, something has been cited. Or if there are photos, you know, audio files, where the first thing I look for is who put these on the Internet or who put these in the newspaper, where they come from. If I can't get an answer on that, I just give up because it's unlikely it's going to be real because anyone interested in being taken seriously is going to have contact information. They will have files. You know, no, I'm not saying, you know, I, I'm not taking this to a ridiculous degree because things like UFO sightings and, and strange sounds, so-called ghost sightings, these aren't things you can just sit around and go, okay, here we go, here's my camera, let me capture something. You know, you're lucky if you capture it. So by just by nature of, you know, you don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to look like a fool. Yeah, and you're right, people who report these things, I've... But the, the greater amount of them, the very greater amount, 
they have no interest in, in, in hoaxing or, or lying, but there are misperceptions. And that's why if I can't find, step one, as I just mentioned, if I can't find provenance, you know, okay, who took this picture? Who put this here? Where did this come from? Then I'm not even going to bother because there's only so many hours in the day. But there are, you know, there are things that so far, you know, no one's been explaining. I can't. So I, I'm, I'm still open, at least uh, it's changed to like 1%. I'm still open about the, the fact that we're not as smart as we think we are. We don't know everything we think we do, but we don't. And that's, that door is still open, and that's what keeps me interested, is that uh, I still think there's a genuine chance of un- unknown things happening. I don't know what they are, what they could be, but I, I don't have all the answers. I got all the questions. Well, and that's a problem. We all have those questions. And as you study up on this more, and you talk to more researchers, you get your sources that you obviously have to vet out for their information as well, do you think the public who has interest in the UFO has been duped by a lot of these television shows and so-called researchers out there? Uh, Yes, television is the worst offender, my God. Um which is why I don't watch it any longer. Uh, I, mean, I mean, in my case, time is part of the problem. But, uh, you know, easily I could, I could watch it later or whatever I want. Um, but, you know, there, there are some of these shows that are, going, that are talking about history, right? I don't even want to go into it. <laughs> but I, I have to mention it because you asked me, um, where they're mentioning things that, that have happened historically, right? And then putting this layer on top of it, of, okay, well, Vikings were here, they were here, and, you know, we think the Chinese were in Nebraska. I'm like, oh, please, this is this is going back. And uh, unfortunately, on, when people see things on television, um, they're, they're probably apt to believe what they're seeing is real. And if they're not very well educated, they're going to believe it even more. And uh, as, as is said in the journalism field, if it bleeds, it leads. Sensationalism will always sell. Someone like me being critical, I never would, be, would appear on TV. And if I was, it would be heavily edited because no one's interested in hearing that something isn't real. They, they, want, they want to know the real stuff and what's going on. And they want to see alien abductions and they want to believe all that stuff because real, the real world is much scarier. They want escapism. And these TV shows provide exactly that. Some of them are, are showing things as fact that were disproved over 50 years ago, and people are still sucking it up. And then they're coming to me and saying, hey, did you ever hear about this? I'm like, yes, I did. <laughs> and if you would have put a little research into it, you'd see that it was uh, BS, and people are making money off it. It's, it's annoying as hell. It's angering. And it's, you know, they need to be teaching critical thinking a tad more sharply than they are in schools these days. So... Who can people believe, or what can they believe then? Because one, don't, don't believe. That's that's the fault. That's the one thing Keel was great at saying. You know, belief is the enemy. Because once you believe, you don't think anymore. I mean, if you're referring to belief in the way I am, belief, belief is emo- is based in emotion. Like you know, people believe in God. That's an emotional belief. That is not a logical belief. I'm not saying it has to be, because if it fulfills a need in you that you need comfort for, I'm, I'm for it. I believe in comfort. There you go. But in terms of, well, who do you turn to for, let's say, accuracy? And, you know, have they done their homework? That's going to be a completely personal opinion. When I say point to me, um, well, I might, because I'm not going to make, at least I hope not, I'm not going to make a statement designed to, let's say, I'm not going to say, okay, I can definitely say that was an alien, meaning extraterrestrial spacecraft that you just saw, because I will never be able to prove that, nor can the person reporting it. So I'd be a liar if I said, like on these TV shows, you know, the alien spacecraft that crashed at Roswell, where they're already biased by making that statement, and you might not sit around long enough to see what comes after that. So you're thinking, oh, yeah, that's true. Everybody knows that. Well, everybody doesn't do research and check their facts. And as far as where you're going to find those today, um, well, stay off the Internet, step one. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's probably better to ch- actually trust the, the very major 
um, respected news outlets, such as the, I mentioned earlier, BBC News, they're not up to manipulation. National Public Radio, people are going to step on me for mentioning them, at least in America, NPR, they're, they're fairly reliable because they're not driven, they're not funded by corporations. Uh, usually they're not. Let's, let's backtrack a bit on that. They, they want to give you information, not their opinion on the information. So it's, I have to say, it's very difficult to answer that question, who do who you go for, who you go to for accurate information. Well, don't go to television and, and these shows, I'll tell you that. Okay, what about books? What about radio shows? What should be, people be listening for or reading for in order to gain some sort of accuracy? Well, without sounding like a total Weisenheimer, you know, your show, for instance, you're, you're talking to people who, who are believers. You're talking to people who are exactly not believers. You're talking to people who are, are not sure. That's a valuable resource right there, is, is your show. And then there are, there are other writers out there. There are some, um, let's see, should I name them? Sure, why not? Um, but the most skeptical, that's my term. I don't like the term debunker because that implies a hostility behind it. But, you know, some of these people are hostile. And the thing is, why I try and maintain my position is that I think a lot of the so-called debunkers are as off their rockers as the believers because it, it, you're not doing anybody a service by saying, ah, oh, you're a nut, there's no UFOs, because th that's just, you're dismissing that person's, re you know, their reality. You know, it's, it's like being a racist. Well, I don't like you because you're black. That's a horrible way to be. So I, I don't want to be like, let's say, the bigot of, of ufology or, or paranormal things. Um, but, I, you know, there are people I go to. There, there is Sharon Hill, who, who has uh, Doubtful News. It's a website where she really analyzes, you know, videos and UFO reports. But she has no interest in, and she doesn't want any of that to be true, right, any, anything paranormal. However, she does state, you know, now if, if it's proved to me beyond a matter of a doubt, in her case meaning, you know, scientific evidence, she'll accept it. I'm the same way. But I just, I haven't seen anything like that. Um, as far as the books being published, uh, well, there's my book, Black Light, Perspectives on Mysterious Phenomena. You can pick that up and go, okay, this Probowski guy is on the fence. Well, I'm, I'm higher on the fence now because I'm like, I've got 1% of that fence where I, I, I'm going to leave that open. And I probably will to the day I die because I don't think we can explain every UFO sighting or every ghost sighting. I don't think that. And there are, there are scads of books out there now. God, there's so many. But the good thing is you can go to Amazon and read a sample of some of these books. And right away, they, you know, based on your, your cultural background, your personal belief, you'll decide whether or not it's worth reading. But everything else is going to be subjective, even everything I say. It's based on you know, what, I, what I've seen and my logic. I, I try and keep the emotion out of it because that leads to belief. And once you believe, you, you're in a dangerous area because your emotions are tied up in it. Do you believe, then, that there is a tie-in, whatever that tie-in may be, between the paranormal field of ghosts and spirits combined with extraterrestrials somehow? Yeah, I, I think so. As, as far as what that is, I, I think the connection is if, if you go in and you read, um, I'm being less than objective here, but if you read the works of of the uh, of Carl Jung, the, the psycho, the, the, basically the inventor of psychotherapy, where where he describes um, the collective unconscious and how you know he, he was the first to come up with the archetypes and how we how we project we project our inner let's just say in this instance, our fantasies and our fears onto the real world. So let's say, and I've, I've seen this in myself with, with my own so-called UFO sighting. My first thought was, it's a UFO. My second thought was, it's a blimp. My third, my, the overriding emotion of the whole experience was, I wouldn't call it terror, but I was pretty afraid. 
So right there, I'm projecting my own inner fear and experience on a physical phenomenon. So Carl Jung, that is, that is someone to go to for, you know, like an underlying, and he even wrote a book about flying saucers. In the, I think it came out in 1964, where, he, where he's psychologically studying people who report these things, and he was the first to report that these aren't insane people that there are just regular people having extraordinary experiences. Uh, and I think we play a bigger role in it, uh, in, including people reporting seeing ghosts, having so-called poltergeist experiences, that a lot of it has to do with us, because there are there's so many reports of people saying, don't you see that person standing in the corner? And their friend going, no, there's nothing there. So how do you explain that? Well, it's a genuine ghost or a spirit, right? Or it's an inner projection coming from an individual. And that, I'll see, all that fascinates me, how they are connected. But I, I think the connection isn't due to necessarily external entities, but I do think there's a trigger, and that trigger could be outside of us, and no one knows what it is. But that's what keeps me going and being interested couple more questions from our audience for you. Claudia is asking, it seems that extraterrestrials are quite highly advanced. Bill, what do you think about the idea that they could avoid leaving evidence, but they don't? If this is true, how could you get the evidence to prove it to you? Hmm. Well, number one, I don't think they've been here, not even once. And if they were, would, would it be, no well, today it would be noticeable although as you're saying I, I don't want to like you know trample around your question but if they are coming here they, number one yeah they would be exceptionally advanced they wouldn't have to be that far advanced though but they they probably would be able to conceal themselves completely because we're pretty close to that to that phase if you look into um developments in quantum I don't want to say, no, it's not quantum physics. It's a quantum technology, quantum processing that would en enable a, an object or a person to be invisible using reflective, using like pixel technology. It's actually a physical technology. That seems to be coming along pretty well. So we don't know how far advanced that is. So let's just postulate uh, an extraterrestrial race. Yeah, they could conceal themselves, therefore we would not know they're here at all. But if they're interacting... On a, on a human level with us, I mean, a, a physical level, uh, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leave marks somehow. How do you prove? Well, you can prove physical evidence, okay? You can prove that, but you cannot prove where it came from. Unless it's, you know, some undeniable thing like you see in the movies with, with a craft or an entity being visible that everyone is looking at and filming, that would prove it to me. But that's what it would take. And let's get to a question from Bill here. Bill is asking, fellow Bill, what do you think of the theory that our DNA is not special or unusual at all, and the same DNA has been spread all over the universe, seeding other planets since the beginning of time? Uh, not very much, because life on this planet, the, the fact that it's here at all is, I, I'm, I'm not um, smug enough to dismiss it and say, uh, it's just all complete randomness, but it could be. And by that very reason, like ev evolution is the result of a lot of complicated little steps, accidents, randomness, and that resulted in us, right? And the chances of a another species on another planet following those exact steps, that randomness, those accidents, impossible. So it, the the if there are even any bipeds on other planets, that would be a miracle in itself. I'm not saying there can't be life forms, because there probably are. I mean, what a waste of space, right? But as far as the DNA, I, I think it is. It's, it's unique to this biosphere. So do you think, then, when it comes to DNA or extraterrestrial intelligence, that, you know, they're just a completely separate species, you're not buying into any of this ancient alien-type theory? Uh, no, never, never. I, I, if you just listen to what I said, it's not possible. Do the math. I, I, now, in another biosphere, yeah, there could very well be intelligent creatures. There could be silicon-based creatures, um, 
you know, who, who, there could be a digital intelligence, but there will not be a D. Well, it, it, it would be idiotic of me to say there is not DNA in other star systems. I, you know, would you call it that? There's, there have there have to be the elements of life, yeah, and they have to come from somewhere. But whether or not it's going to be us and all this ancient aliens stuff, no, I, I just don't buy into that because you don't need any of it to explain why we're here. So do you believe then that maybe every different species out there has its own god particle, much like they believe there is the god particle here on Earth? Um, well, if I'm, if I'm understanding it in the way that I think I am, I don't know. Maybe I'm not understanding. I, I know about the God particle and what that what that portends, but I, in applying it to the human species, yeah, I think we're we're unique because there's not there's not going to be another biosphere like this. There may be biospheres close to this, as they think, because you know, look at how many extra solar planets have been detected. Some of which probably have have bodies of water. You know, but what what I'd like to see tested, and, and people have tried, is, okay, if you have this water, you have this temperature, you have this gravity, do you automatically get life? Well, I, no one's proved that yet, but yet it evolved here. So that's, that's my other, you know, 1% open door thing there. I'm not saying I believe in intelligent design, but if you look at how complicated we are, I, I, sometimes I have a hard time believing is that word again, that that all is the result of accident. But if you look at how long we've been on the planet, or at least life, billions of years, it's had a lot of time for experiment, self-experimentation and, you know, pass, fail, this doesn't work, and then the old survival of not necessarily the fittest, but the most efficient could be all based on that, and probably is. So people who are having extraterrestrial experiences, then, if you believe that we haven't, been visited on that note what do you think is happening to them well number number one there a certain section of people who report these things they're already biased toward extraterrestrial explanation therefore whatever happens to them <clears throat> make it have a lucid dream a bad nightmare and they're going to think that was an abduction experience or the um you know night terrors are a known phenomenon I had one when I was eight years old, extremely terrifying experience where you think, well, you are awake, but you're, you're still in a dream state and you're paralyzed and you, you can see anything in your imagination projected. You know, it could be the worst monster in your imagination. That, that, is, an, that is one explanation. Does it explain everything? Well, possibly not. But if you look at some of these, the, 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 the so-called abductees, who have been put under close scrutiny for, uh, like, anomalous marks on their bodies, scrape marks, things like that. Well, anybody can find scars on their body that they don't know how they got them. I mean, and speaking for myself, most of mine are explained, believe me. But there are a few where I don't know where I got it. But, again, why go to the most out there, near impossible explanation for what you're going through when there are so many others, literally a spectrum, before you go to the extraterrestrial one. And again, it's based on belief systems. You want there to be extraterrestrials. You want to feel special. So they're interested in you, and they're taking you, and doing all these ridiculous, crude things that, again, a medical student could do, or I could even do better. Psychological, emotional reasons, religious belief systems, that's behind people's abduction experiences. And also a lot of disturbing psychological things like fugue states, uh, which other people would call missing time, can also explain these things. I think it's a very intriguing part of the whole discussion because people are having oh, yeah. daytime sightings, nighttime sightings, never mind just the dream state. I would normally believe with you or believe you on this entire topic, but my first ET I saw, my friend, was at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I was wide awake and I had a witness with me. So... I think we'll agree to disagree on that one, and that's okay. We're allowed. We're yes, totally we are. allowed. That's what keeps the world spinning. Absolutely. We only got about 30 seconds with you, my friend. 
because you're only here for the first two hours tonight because you got a lot of writing to do, man. A lot yeah, of writing. Yeah, I have to write stupid books. Just kidding. They will not be stupid books. But they well, will help pay medical bills. <laughs> Yes, for sure. And you know what? I'm going to ask all of our Spaced Out Radio audience out there to send some love and some prayers your way to you and your wife out there. If my audience, who is completely awesome, wouldn't mind because we want to see your wife get healthy and we're going to send a bunch of positive energy over that way. I really believe in in that. And, you know, I'm hoping that we can get it working for you, my friend. Uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you very much, my friend. All right. You take care, and we will talk to you very soon, Bill. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Hour number three with Eric Markham and myself coming up right after this. The SOR Sightlines is a place for you to find answers to your strange experiences. Hi there. This is Mike Schmidt. If you have had an encounter with ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, ETs, or anything else that doesn't make sense, Head to spacedoutradio.com and file a Sightlines report. All information you give is 100% confidential, and I will personally help you find the answers you need. SOR Sightlines. Your answers are a click away. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. We'll give you some equipment updates and some of our experiences on the road. Right here on Spaced Out Radio. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with the Four Cop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Witkowski's Strange Days. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. Have you checked out the SOR Spacewire at spacedoutradio.com yet? Every day we post the latest stories regarding the weird, strange, and completely unbelievable. From cryptid and UFO sightings to the conspiracy world, we tackle it all. Hi there, I'm Eric Markham, Space Out Radio's news director for the SOR Space Wire. And if you have a story, I want to hear it. Email me at news at spaceoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. 
Every month on Spaced Out Radio, we look into the deep and dark reports of cryptids roaming around the world with me, Rob Morphy, from Cryptopia.us. I would love it if you would join me and host Dave Scott as we delve into the most arcane stories and reports regarding creatures of the unknown. My job is to hunt down the details and bring the evidence forward to you. These aren't your regular Bigfoot stories I'm talking about either. You can find out more about crypto history at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. Spacedoutradio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between. Hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with us on Spaced Out Radio? Head to spacedoutradio.com to check out the latest shows, guests, and sponsors. And don't forget to sign up for the Space Travelers Club. You'll find all you need at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome back to the final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. We are opening it up to your questions in the chat rooms. Topic doesn't matter. I am joined by the SOR Space Wires, Eric Markham, also part of S4 with E Squared. We'll bring Eric in in a moment. We want to say thank you to everyone listening in on the United Public Radio Network live on 107.7 FM in New Orleans and 160 countries around the world. You're bringing in some big numbers now that you're finding out that there's a nighttime show here. Thank you so much for becoming part of of the Spaced Out Radio family and allowing us to broadcast into your ears and your mind. Revolution Radio is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Do us a favor, freedomslips.com is the place to go if you could donate today. Bill Cardwell set the password in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Obfuscatory. Obfuscatory is your password. Make sure you use it wisely because you don't want to use it wrong. Obfuscatory. Better than last night's, Bill. Good job with that one. I can pronounce this one. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Tune us in on TuneIn. Download our shows on iTunes. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. While there, you can join the SOR Space Travelers Club. It only costs about 5 bucks a month on average. With that, we give you some pretty cool swag. On a monthly basis, that's the way we like to do things around here. You can read up on the SOR Space Wire. Check out my latest blog. I'd love for you to comment on it as well. If you like our music, you can click the Bumblefoot banner. Listen to Mr. Ron Thal, our resident guitar god. And of course, if you've had a strange sighting you can't explain, do me a favor. Fill out a Sightlines report. Mike Schmidt is waiting to hear from you. 
so he can report on it. We bring in Eric Markham from the SOR Space Wire now and S4 with E squared. Eric, how's your beard doing? Perfect, perfect. That's what we like to hear because, you know, we, we like a good beard around these parts. It's getting nice and thick. I, I wish I could do that. My daytime career doesn't allow me to do that. I really... Fully understand, fully understand, you know, because you got to be professional sometimes. That's okay. As long as it's not rubbing up against your, your microphone, we're good. So what we're going to do here, Eric, is we're going to continue on with the UFO talk, but we're going to take some questions as well from our audience. And I forgot to turn your mic on, so that's my bad. My bad. I made an error. This is what happens when you get a little tired, my friend. You get a little tired and you make silly, silly mistakes. Your beard is doing good. <laughs> yeah, have taken on a life of its own. Yes. Anyhow, what we're going to do here is we are going to open up the questions to our audience in the chat rooms. So we're going to talk about UFOs, but if you have any other questions that you would like Eric or me to answer, feel free to hop on in, ask a question, type it in capital letters, and we're going to get things going. So now that you're here, I'm going to read off Bill Cardwell's question. He is asking, If all living things on this planet store information using RNA and DNA, and there is very compelling evidence of a shared ancestry then why wouldn't you believe it could be universe-wide? What do you think, Eric? Oh, I've heard of the, the, span ther uh, the panspermia theory of distribution of life, and I see some good, uh, good points about it. I think you get a basic building block, and then you, you, know, you have evolution to take it from there. What I don't go... I'm not so sure I can accept that there wasn't a guiding influence behind it. Because the odds of DNA self-assembling and creating something, a tree, a human, a fish, is roughly the same odds as a tornado going through a junkyard and leaving a fully functional assembled 747 in its in its path um, I think DNA was created somewhere now whether it was adv advanced beings God whatever you want to call it I believe that there was a force behind the creation of the base pairs themselves and the rest like I said the rest as your previous guest said the you know, these things have had billions of years of rearrange, go down an evolutionary path, uh, hit a dead end, start over. You know, once you get to the, once you have the machinery set in motion, as I believe you get the variations and all the different species. I just don't think it's going to happen randomly. They have tried to take the amino acids that make up the base pairs they've dropped them in a soup a primordial soup they've tried adding electricity they've uh heat all these different combinations and at the end of the day all they've got in their flask is the goo they started with so there had to be something that got it all started there's a continuation of that question, and Bill is asking, if identical DNA and RNA was spread around the universe, it wouldn't make the same creatures found on Earth since it would depend on the environment it came into contact with on each planet. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I, I can see that. Uh, the way the base pairs arrange, uh, let's see, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine would be influenced by the environment of the planet or the ecosystem they were dropped in. 
So you might get and you see all the variation we have just here on Earth using those same base pairs based on our gravity, our environmental variables, heat, wind, sun, right? You know, all the things that make up what we take for granted as our environment. On another planet or another system where you have the viable base pair, I guess that's why I should say the viable base pairs, they have to be in a situation where they can self-replicate or they can replicate from the base pair. If you had a completely different set of of in, environmental factors, you would get God knows what. But I think everything we evolve the way we do: two eyes at the top, two legs at the bottom. We evolve the way we do, and life on Earth seems to have pretty much the same plan, for a few exceptions. The by what we had to do to survive to get this far, you know, we grew, up, we became bipedal, and you know, mammals with eyes at the top of our heads so we could see above the grass, see our prey or see our predators. In another situation where you don't have that those same stresses, who knows what you'd get? Sentient worms, or you know, it it, it could have just been anything. Tool use also had a big use, uh, big influence on it. The ability to grab something in the environment and use it for something it wasn't designed for, like the chimpanzees that grab a stick and tease the ants out of a a log with it. You know, tool use, which increases you know the use of tools creates more brain function and that's passed down elizabeth has an intriguing comment in regards to this she says but earth's environment has changed so much over time this planet was an alien planet to what it is today at different points in time yeah and if you <clears throat> okay during the time of the dinosaurs the atmosphere was warmer uh Oxygen, I believe oxygen content was higher. So you had a situation and which you would have needed to have these huge theropods that, you know, 80 feet long, you know, things that don't exist today because, one, I don't think our current oxygen level would actually support a creature that size. And I think as... This, as the environment changes, we've had mass extinctions. The Pleistocene saw mass extinctions. There's a can't. There was a Cambrian explosion, where just untold. We don't even know everything that sprouted up during that Cambrian explosion. Was followed by another mass die-off. The environment changed. The creatures that had evolved to live in that environment couldn't do it anymore. The ones that were hardy enough to live into the next set of environmental settings became the next dominant life form and evolved from there. So as the Earth evolves, it I guess it shakes the shakes the fleas off and starts over. I'm convinced we're not the first technological society, technologically advanced for what we are species to have inhabited this planet i think mankind if mankind has existed in the far distant past i think we've gotten up to the level where we could blow each other up have done it and had to start from scratch i think it's happened several times very much so i'm still not sure about that because i am a creationist which would kind of throw that fully out of the loop but it would explain why, if you read biblically, why God wiped out everybody with a couple of floods. Well, <clears throat> being a, as a, crea- a creationist, believing that God did it all, who's to say, I, I, I kind of look at it this way, God used the tools 
of chemistry and evolution. He may have, you know, I'm, I, be, I believe in God myself. You know, it's, I think it's, you're an eternal being. What do you do for entertainment? How do you keep yourself from going insane? You know, stir some chemicals up on a planet and watch what happens. Take an interest if they become sentient and go from there. I think DNA, evolution, and environmental forces are the tools that the creator uses. I don't think it's just a matter of him putting Play-Doh people together and breathing life into them. What's the challenge for that? in that? Just my opinion. I didn't agree with Bill Grabowski's version that we haven't been visited before. I've talked to way too many people and I've had my own experiences point blank that lead me to believe otherwise. It's pretty simple when you see something you can't explain with your eyes open. And I realize a lot of people are having their experiences at nighttime when they are sleeping. We could easily write it off as a dream state, you know, in some deep REM type sleep. But for those who of us who have seen the awakened side of extraterrestrial contact, where we have been awake, where we have been conscious, to me, and I respect Bill a lot, but that seems, for all the research that he's done, a little narrow-minded. Yeah, that kind of struck me as, okay, this is a ufologist saying they, they don't exist and we haven't been visited. Um. It's like a priest that doesn't believe in God. I kind of see him being at odds with his own study. I almost feel like maybe, in all due respect, maybe he got discouraged like a priest that loses faith and then becomes an atheist. I'm wondering if something hasn't discouraged him to a point where now he's attacking his own subject. But you can see his point, though. There's so much disinformation out there. And this is why I let him go and didn't challenge him on it. Okay, which I probably should have, but ran out of time. But with all the disinformation out there, whether it's being fed by MUFON, whether it's being fed by SETI, NASA, the government, whoever the alphabet group may be, Eric or even if there's any organizations out there who are creating these tapes and slabbering them all over YouTube and other video channels. You can see where he or someone of his ilk and research would be a little jaded, shall we say, in believing anything that is truly out there. So that's playing devil's advocate on it all. Well... Okay, in the case of Bob Bigelow more or less buying out MUFON, if MUFON wasn't on to something, why would he have bought it? I I think there's there's something out there. Yeah, you can go to you can go to YouTube and you can spend all night watching Honest to God, true UFO landing in England or whatever. You know, you can find this hyped up crap. But that doesn't mean that there isn't legitimate sightings, there's, that there's not people that really, I mean, I have no doubt what I saw a couple months ago. I mean, it just, you know, it wasn't a satellite, it wasn't a shooting star. And I don't think it was an experimental aircraft. If it was, it's, we don't need to worry about the rest of the world messing with us because we've got that. If it was ours and we've got that kind of technology, it seems like we could snuff out our enemies with the push of a button. So there, I have seen things that I don't think they belong here. Shar is asking me, she says, Dave, I know what you say. Let me read this again. Dave, I know you saw what you saw, but are you sure it wasn't government made hologram or something else? And I can say 
100% because I had a witness with me who was an ET contactee and Samantha Mowat, it was 100% real, the first one that I saw. And I don't know how developed they are in holograms, but this was a pretty solid object. And I really don't think that the U.S. government is, or any government is going to run into a forest in the middle of the daytime on a call of five days after a UFO landing to go set up shop to try and put a hologram in a private forest area. I just don't see that happening. So, Shar, I'm not putting you down with that, but no, I believe what Samantha Mowat and I saw at that time was 100% authentic. Bill Cardwell has a comment for you, Eric. Okay. And he is saying, Eric, I'm not talking about evolution. What I'm suggesting is that when life is finally found beyond our planet, may share some of the same common ancestry as we do, but it evolves in its own way, the same way as everything or every living thing on this planet has done. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I think we will find other life. I, If it uses the same building blocks, we're going to have some kind of similarity. We'll be able to track down, track to the, you know, go back to the DNA that this life has. But I, I agree. It could be, it could evolve completely differently. We might, we might not even recognize it as life at first. There's life forms on this planet people thought were rocks. And then it turns out they're actually living organisms. They just look like rocks. We're so we're still discovering new life forms on this planet. It just the the myriad of creation, it just it, it boggles my mind as a biologist the different forms things can take. So I agree I agree with Bill. I think even if it was panspermia, the same building blocks are spread through the universe. I think we're going to have differences based on where we, we evolved. But deep down, when you get down to the molecular level, that's where we're all going to be the same. I got a question for you from Corey. Corey is asking, there is a theory that when time hits a certain point that it reverses to the point that it all starts and starts all over again and that it's happened several times. What is your thoughts on this? Well, that's sort of in line with the uh, Hindu belief that you know creation starts, goes to a point, and then is destroyed and starts over. So there's actually a mythological basis for that as far as the flow of time as we see it i'm not sure that at this point in our visible universe what we can our physical universe what we can understand that time can flip backwards i mean things may change to where it can but at this point right now where we are in this timeline at this at this point in the universe, I think time only has one direction it can flow. It's not to say that as the universe ages, certain physical properties change, and time could flow backwards. But the whole uh, creation, destruction, creation, destruction, it goes, you know, that was one of the, early theories about the universe that it would expand to a point then it would collapse back and then it would explode again you know go from big bang to just almost where it dissipated to where there was nothing left but then it would start to slowly coalesce and then compact down into that singularity that it started out as Char makes a comment in the Space Out Radio chat room. She says, I don't think there is anything out there like Earth. That's why they want it. And I will answer that one this way. If they wanted it, they'd have already taken it. Think about it. If they have the technology to get here 
from millions upon millions of miles away, billions of miles, wherever they may be, they could take this place. If they have the ability, and it's on record, of flying over nuclear missile sites in North Dakota and shutting down the missile silos, they're not worried about nuclear weapons. They could take us. And I think that's a picture that through all the negativity of extraterrestrials, Eric, out there, that we tend to think, well, they want our planet, they want our people, they want to use us for food or slaves or whatever, and the paranoia and the fear-mongering comes in. And I'm not saying Char's being that way, okay? But I'm saying, speaking in general here, if they can get here and shut down our nuclear weapons programs, they could obviously wipe us out if they wanted. What's your thoughts on that? I, if there really was an e, uh, say an advanced civilization, if they can get here, the uh, power that they that is at their command is godlike. You know, not to, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious. I'm just saying that if these if these people can get here, there's nothing we have on this planet that's going to stand against them. And if they wanted what we had, they would take it. I just, it, it's Godzilla versus Bambi. There's no way we would, you know, like Independence Day, where we, we fight the, hey, if they could have got here, the, once they get here, we're, if their intentions are bad, they're going to carry them out. There's not a damn thing we could do about it. I fully agree with that. And Char's follow-up is, but who says they did that? As in, shut down the nuclear weapons facilities. There's plenty of research in regards to that. You know? Oh, I've heard the people interviewed on that a lot. There were some eyewitnesses. Uh, can't think of the guy's name. He, he shows up on Coast to Coast every once in a while. and uh, Or I heard Art Bell interview him. He was actually standing watch at one of these missile silo sites and the guards on top side reported the UFO. I mean, this stuff has actually been written down in log books because you can't pass gas standing a nuke watch that you don't log it down somewhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and everything in those areas is so tightly knit and very tightly secure. And I'm trying to get the names. I know Ed, Dr. Edgar Mitchell had talked about it. Mm-hmm. And I can't. I know. Oh, who, I know John. Who, John. Son, oh, it almost it was on tip of my tongue, and when I tried to say it, it disappeared. And it wasn't just uh, you know, if it was just one guy in uh. Montana saying that it happened, I might not agree. You know, I might be able to blow it off. But the Russians reported it too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, the, and the paranoia was, of course, we thought maybe the Russians were doing it to us and they thought we were doing it to them. So it, it happened with the two big nuclear clubs on the planet. They've turned them on, they've turned our nukes on. And they've turned them off. I mean, to, to me, that's that's your disclosure right there. If the flyover in the 50s, of, what, 1954, when they flew over D.C. wasn't enough for you. The fact that they've turned, on, turned off our nukes ought to be enough for anybody. It is a scary piece because the nuclear weapon right here, as we know of, and it may be turning into laser technology or sound technology or whatever it may be, whatever they're testing in some of these free-range places that we don't know about. But as for right now, the main defense mechanism for anybody on Earth is nuclear weapons. And when these extraterrestrials... Uh, Captain Robert Salas was the man. Yes. Okay, that's it, yeah. Yes, and his sighting happened at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, March 16th, 1967. 
And yep. I just want to read this quote of his. He says, I was on duty when an object came over and hovered directly over the site. The missile shut down 10 minute man missiles. And the same thing happened at another site a week later. There's a strong interest in our missiles by these objects wherever they come from. I personally think they are not from planet Earth. I agree, and I think it's just their way of saying, okay, children, put your toys in the toy box and get past this. I mean, it's ridiculous, the nuclear proliferation. I hope that they're all being used as deterrents, but forgot, you know, it's the, the insanity of our species. People wonder why they why they don't land on the White House lawn and say, take me to your leader. Well, they got to be looking at a, a species that basically craps in its own nest, fouls its own water, and build enough missiles of nuclear missiles to annihilate all Earth life. I mean, everything but cockroaches and bacteria. They got to think, man, those are some crazy talking monkeys down there. We better just watch them for a while. But that's the whole point on the other end. Are we just some really good reality TV show for them, whoever they are? My oldest daughter just read a... It it unsettled her. She's just, because of my connection with SOR, she's starting to look into the the non-mainstream thoughts and topics, and she read an article about how we're just a zoo for the ETs, and it upset her to the point where she says, God, I wish I'd never had children. And it's like, well, you know, that's that, that's old news. It, and if it's true, well, give them the best performance you can. John has yeah. a comment about that. He says, you know, the War of Los Angeles, also a good example, all that conventional firepower we threw up at them, and they just hung there in the sky, unfazed and untouched. Yeah, they heard, but they heard the shells impacting the object that they were shooting at. Okay, the whole thing of it being a Japanese balloon. Japan balloons don't the balloons they had that they sent over, and I, I think they just found one undetonated about five years ago up in your area. They were small, and they had nerve. I think they had nerve gas on them. You know. A BB gun would have taken one down. They were firing howitzers, three-inch guns at this object in Los Angeles, machine guns. I mean, and they could, you know, at times they could hear a metallic clink as the stuff bounced off. You know, that that blows the balloon theory out. I think the Battle of Los Angeles... I'm not sure what the motivation, because how do you think like an E.T.? We don't have the same frame of reference. Were they just innocently like, wow, what's going on down there? What, you know, what's all this? Was it curiosity? Was it a show of power saying y'all think you're tough because, you know, you're, you're all killing each other by the millions. So guess what? You're not the baddest people in the (laughs) neighborhood. I don't know. I've always been intrigued by that one, but I don't. I don't believe the. Uh, I don't believe the balloon. They like said you could brought a balloon down with a thirty caliber rifle or a BB gun. I want to ask you, with Bill earlier in the show, we were talking about John Podesta, and I'm just not over this. I really am not over this because. When you have the right-hand man of two United States presidents and one wannabe president talking about and absolutely going public with his love and wanderlust of ufology, you have to think that it isn't over for him yet. I would hope not. I, I hope that he... I don't know. I, I wish you could get him on when the smoke settles. I think we're going to hear more from him. If he is that legitimately balls deep into the subject, I don't think he's going to just go quietly into the woodwork. One, I think he likes being in the spotlight. I think that 
what he does for a living and what he's done tells me he likes being a center of attention. I don't think we've heard the last of him. I don't know if he's going to, maybe he'll team up with somebody like Stephen Bassett. You know, I think there, I got the right one. Yes. You know what? But there's a guy, if MUFON wanted to create any credibility whatsoever, MUFON would hire him or try to convince John Podesta to become their president and CEO. Maybe he's more effective by being out there without any kind of trammels or limitations. Because it seems like if you belong to any kind of organization, the organization is going to push you in a direction. And I think MUFON's, from what I've read lately of MUFON, I I don't know, I think they got to where they were getting too close to the truth and they had to be silenced. I don't know why they just decided to use Bob Bigelow as the instrument to silence them, but or it could it just you know could Bob Bigelow just be egomaniacal enough that it's like I'm going to know the truth and screw the rest of the world? Yeah, I don't know how that would work, but yeah, I think somebody, I think John Podesta's got a, a brilliant second career coming up or third career coming up in the ufology sector but but the question is eric how much can he say because this is a man who was obviously giving high security clearance to sensitive documents possibly national security documents he can't all of a sudden come out in public and state that by the way this is what we know about ufos uh i don't know that that's true dave i think if he wanted to or I mean, how how would you prosecute something like that? I'm I'm thinking I'm playing Tre- devil's treason. advocate. Treason. Well, yeah, but is it? Well, yeah. Then he'd end up like a Snowden, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I think if he wants to divulge, there's a, he'll figure out a way. I'm not sure how much of what's covered up by. Uh, or, or what oath he took, what he had to take for his clearance. I'm not sure how much real... He's such a public figure, I don't think he could be silenced. You know, if he decided to go rogue and say, hey, this is what we know, one, he'd have an incredible groundswell of support. I, I think he'd be high profile enough that they couldn't really do much with him. I don't know. I, I don't think know. He, I think because he knows how to get the media on his side. I understand that, but I'm going to use a sports analogy, a hockey analogy here. They always said Gre- Wayne Gretzky was untradeable. Hmm. Right? And don't forget, there is precedence, shall we say, of knocking off high-profile people Go back to the 60s with the Kennedys. Or trying Reagan in 81. Mm. Yeah. Heart heart attacks happen. Heart attacks happen. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. That's what one of those uh, high-ranking KGB official once said. In Russia, our problems have heart attacks. In America, they get cancer. Mm Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, man, got me thinking there. I th- well, don't hurt yourself. Oh, too late. <laughs> <laughs> My thinky pain. No, uh, I just think, I that think he. I think he'll it. know what he can put. I think he's a adroit enough of a politician that he'll know what he can divulge in such a way to maybe open the door a little bit to, to get a crack started. Because I, I think there's a critical mass where there's going to be a point where enough inform- you know, real information is out there, not disinformation, not wishful thinking, but enough true information is going to be out there that the floodgates are going to burst. 
And I think John Podesta may be one of those people who has enough of the information that he might be able to, you know, he might be able to get that crack started without jeopardizing himself. And there's always the leak. <laughs> you know, the, you can always get WikiLeaks to do, <laughs> do something. But, I mean, I, I think if, there, if he, his passion is that great, he'll find a way to, to at least get enough information out there to get others looking in the right direction. You know what? This is what I'm going to do right now. I brought up Twitter on my computer. I'm going to send John Podesta a tweet. Let's see if he responds. He That'd hasn't awesome. tweeted since November 7th, but let's ask him this right now. At John Podesta, what happens to hashtag disclosure now, now that Hillary... Uh, let's go at Hillary Clinton is not POTUS. And then we'll tag at Steve Bassett about it. How about that? Be interesting to see what kind of answer we get. And I'll put spaced out radio on there. So that way every alphabet group can hear us. Or check us out. There. We've sent him that tweet. Now, do I expect him to respond? No. No, I don't. But it would be interesting. And you never know. Like I mm -hmm. said, he may be... That may be where his eyes are looking now that, you know, the, the race... You know, because Hillary's, Hillary's done. She's no longer... I don't think she'll ever be a political force. You're not going to see her running for president again in four years one. I don't think she's going to be alive in four years. I think she's got some serious health issues. And I just, you know, once you've bombed that badly, I don't think it's going to come, you know, they're not going to say, let's hitch our horse, you know, let's not hitch our wagon to that horse again. So I think she's pretty much done. So he's he's got to be looking for the next project for his life. That may be it. There wasn't enough of a friend. I just, the whole idea of saying that to gin up support and get voting a voting block, I don't think there's enough people in that, in that party to actually have made that big a difference. So I, I think there was really, on his part, a true, sincere attempt or interest in getting disclosure to happen. Bill Cardwell has an interesting question. He is saying, maybe the extraterrestrials are so interested in us, it's because it gives them an idea of how they once were thousands of years ago. You ever think about that? that? Yeah, it might just be like looking at a live, if we could go back to Roman times, and see, of course, we haven't changed that much other than the technology. But yeah, that's a very, very viable idea. We're a, we're a history lesson. Maybe they take us, you know, maybe they come back and look at us and say, now, this is what goes wrong when you do this. We're like a case study on how to, how to screw things up in ways. We've got to be somewhat interesting because, okay, the same race of beings that had Stephen Hawking, Carl Sagan, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Beethoven, also spawned Stalin, Hitler, Idi Amin, Genghis Khan. I mean, we are such a diverse species in what we can achieve. It's got to be kind of interesting to think, how can the same primate have this such a broad spectrum of behaviors? behaviors? I, th I would think we'd be interesting to study. I, I've, I find I study humans for that very reason. You know, and I am a human, obviously, but it's like if we are this 
insane a species and this variable, you know, maybe that's what is unique about us in the universe. I've heard some of your guests say that most of the other species are more mechanical or they let, they're more lockstep than we are. And we're just, we're chaos on two legs. That might be what interests the observers when they come to Earth. It's like, holy crap, look at this. <laughs> Got peaceniks on one side and warmongers on the other. And in the middle, there's just this other class of people that strive to keep their families fed and a roof over their head. What's It's got to be a... a leave them scratching their heads wondering. But the idea of coming back maybe a million years from now, Earth people will look back on this era and go, oh my God, how did we survive it? And they may well, we may be seeing people from the future coming back to see you know, all time. They believe all time happens at once. It's just the way we flow through it and from our perception of the individual slices, but that it's all out there, all happening now. That right now in this living room, you know, in my studio, there's a dinosaur munching leaf fronds off a fern tree. At the same point, I'm sitting here talking, uh, uh, bouncing a signal off a satellite. And further down the line, you know, the the future's already, it, it, it's happening now, too. And it might be their way, it, it, the, some of these ETs might be travelers from our own future coming back to see how we did it, how on earth, you know, it, what kind of miracle occurred to get us past this technological infancy where we were on the verge of annihilating ourselves. Or we damn near did, and we learned, finally learned the lesson and they're coming back to see how, you know, how did it happen? How did that last, you know, why did they do it? And trying not to make the same mistake in their, their own time. Fully agree. Fully agree. It kind of makes me wonder about the whole field of ufology then. As we heard Bill, who says... And it's his belief, he's allowed that belief, which basically says, you know, I really, really do not believe that we have been visited. And there's a lot of researchers out there right now who believe that as well. And this is where I think the mainstream absolutely laughs at us. Because Bill, in his belief, isn't wrong. Me and my belief on what I've seen isn't wrong. People in our audience, their beliefs aren't wrong. They're all just differing opinions. But when it comes to this field of research, Eric, it's no wonder when we can't even come together on whether or not aliens have been on this planet or visited this planet, even though there is hundreds upon thousands, if not millions of cases that say otherwise, we can't even pull our socks up to try and come to some sort of, lack of a better term, cosmic com, uh, completion of a study that says we need to look at this a little bit more. I mean, when you look at the field of ufology, and just speaking ufology, because the paranormal mess with ghosts and everything, that's just, you know, that is a blue light special at Kmart on Cabbage Patch Kids back in the day. They're brawling over there. You know what I'm saying? Right. But, if, but if we just take the field of ufology here for a moment, and we look at the different aspects that people are trying to research, and the experiences people are having, and the people who just are focused on disclosure, if we can't come together as one unit, is there any reason in your mind why the mainstream would take this seriously? Well, I think... I don't think the mainstream's taking it seriously because they're not they're not looking at the big picture. They're looking at these factions and laughing. But if they were thinking critically, they'd say, But wait a minute. There's something, you know, making all these people form these opinions. 
I think the where the mainstream media f- fails is that they haven't they see the smoke but they don't want to look for the fire or they don't realize there is a fire. If we have all these people, these splintered groups and these different thoughts upon a subject, the subject's got to be out there somewhere. And I think that's where the mainstream media is dropping the ball is they need to say there's something to believe in out there and they're not what they're not getting to the bottom of that i just and does it other than using it for ratings boosts i don't think that the mainstream mediums really concentrating on or really looking into it that seriously Gail has a question. She is saying, do you believe then we can come together when there is active obstruction of the reality of alien visitation? Well, the people that believe are going to believe. The people, and there's, it seems like it's a polarized feel. You got the people that don't believe, never will believe, and then you've got the people like you and me and our, our listeners that do believe. Some just on faith, others like me, you know, like me, I haven't had the ET experience. I've seen the craft, but I haven't seen the actual pilots. It's, I think we're already, we are together. It's just a matter of like fish in a tank. We're different species of fish. We're all in the water, and we're all, you know, we all believe we have to breathe the water. So we've got, we have the ET, the believers in extraterrestrial life. I think the the divisions are more of a distraction than anything else. I do think that everybody in this field does need to pull together. I think it needs to be more uh, more encompassed. A, a more inclusive group. I got a uh, question. I got a question from Everett for you, and I'm okay. sorry for cutting you off. We only got That's about right. five minutes left. Oh, quick, quick, quick hour. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Everett is asking on a lighter note here, Eric. We have night vision and infrared technologies. So why do you think so many UFO reports involve craft that are literally lighting up like a Christmas tree? Well, hmm. I've all, I, you know, I've wondered about that too. Is it a holdover? Uh, is are the lights? Are they a form of communication? Kind of like they use in in close encounters, where the lights were part of the communications array. I mean, it's possible that they don't know us as a species enough to know that we can see the the lights or hear maybe they just you know there might we see these these ufos that have all these lights and they flash and all this signaling i wonder if anybody's ever tried to scan the radio dial during one of the are they trying to communicate us through lights and sound and we're just we're so busy looking at the lights, we're not looking at the sound. Or maybe the, maybe they're just functional parts of the, the, the craft. Because you've got to assume they have a home planet and that these ships also operate at the home planet. And maybe these lights you see are the same functions that the navigation lights on an aircraft are. They're to keep, us from, you know, to keep them from bumping into each other. I'm going to tell you something weird here. That tweet I sent out? Yeah. It's not on my feed. According to Twitter right now, the last uh, tweet I sent out was three hours ago. I heard you typing it. I know you sent it. I know I sent it, too. Yeah, that's... this that's is interesting. Yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Let me look at Twitter and see if it showed. No, seriously, I'm looking because you can read your own tweets on here. Right. 
And I'm looking at it, and it was not... Well, I know it's sent because it disappeared, but the tweet is gone. Wow. I am totally tripped out by this right now. Somebody deleted somebody from on high deleted your tweet. That's uh that's interesting. Well, I um, suggest- unless unless just saying unless he has his tweets turned off and cannot accept any tweets right now because he hasn't tweeted since November seventh. Yeah, but would that make it disappear off your your outgoing? I don't know. I don't understand Twitter enough to un- to know, but it seems to me you would have you would have your version of it bef- still in your your sent file. I don't know. It's very very interesting. I'm a little weirded out by this right now. Well, of course they're watching us. Everybody's like, "Hey, they're watching you. They're watching you." Of course yeah. they are. I don't we- think you can have this kind of show and not have Okay. Some here, attention played. Now, played. here here's the interesting part. Ron, who is in the Canadian, uh, or in the SOR Space Travelers Club, he's seeing it on Twitter. Okay. Okay. I'm just not seeing it on my feed that it's been sent. I don't understand. Maybe I'm missing something here. Because Ron has liked the tweet, and he has retweeted the tweet. I'm a little tripped out about this. I don't get it. Huh. Do not get it. Next thing I know, tomorrow night on the show, we're going to have some black suits at Dave's window. (laughs) What's looking in Dave's window tonight? What's looking at Dave's window tonight? (laughs) Joe, I may need to borrow some of your pointy sticks because there might be some visitors at the window tomorrow night over an innocent tweet John Podesta, what happens to hashtag disclosure now that at Hillary Clinton is not hashtag POTUS at Stephen Bassett? I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's another thing. Talk to Stephen Bassett about that. I know you've got you can contact him pretty much at will. Might be it might be interesting to hear his take on Podesta now that Hillary's not POTUS. Well, you know what? That is something that we will do in January. We'll get uh, him back on. Because Steve Bassett is a big fan of this show, a big fan of what we do, and we are definitely fans of his as well. Yes. So, guess what, my friend? I got Bumblefoot. I got Bumblefoot playing in the background. Wow. That was a quick hour. <laughs> I know! I feel like I just got comfortable with my chair. I know, I know. You know what? I need a new captain's chair for the cabin. I really do. If anybody wants to get me a Christmas present this year, I want a new captain's chair. I'll even take one of them faux leather ones. <laughs> I'm not that picky because my ass is killing me in this chair for three hours a night. Send around the change jar. We need a new captain's chair for the old Uncle Jibbo's cabin. Hmm. Do they have staples in Canada? They do. They do. Ah. They Ah. do. The closest one is 45 minutes away. Well, they deliver, too. Wow. Well, I'd go pick it up. I really (laughs) would. My ass is killing me. That's all I'm going to say. Anyhow, Eric, you hold on a second here. I got to remind people that you were listening to Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal on the Space Out Radio side. He is the official music of the mighty SOR. Yes, the former guitar god of Guns N' Roses leads us in and out of every Space Out Radio episode. I want to thank Bumblefoot for his participation in this show. We want to thank Bill Grabowski, who was on the first two hours talking about UFO studies case studies. What a great guy. Smart as anything. Very intelligent researcher. We'll get him back on again. And Eric Markham, to you, my friend, and your beard, which probably needs its own zip code by now. We appreciate you taking the time. I want to say thank you to everyone listening in. Remember, tell a friend about this show. 
And if you want to hear this show or others, you can check out our archives on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show, on Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. You can also go to TuneIn and, of course, on iTunes. Everyone, you have a good night. I am out of here. We will talk to you in 21 hours from now. We're hoping the crypto historian can get back on the air with us tomorrow night. Have a good one. Here we go.